We identified different types of bias and random error, and we differentiated between intention to treat and per protocol analysis. We evaluated the internal validity of superiority clinical trials, and we differentiated between primary, secondary, clinical, and surrogate endpoints used in clinical studies. Now, let's interpret clinical and surrogate endpoints used in superiority clinical trials. Clinical trials can have various number of groups or arms. For example, a single arm study will include a single group of patients, whereas a double arm study will evaluate two groups of patients, which is most common. So majority of clinical trials have two arms in their study. Some studies can also have multiple arms of patients. Now, ideally, you would like to have a control group in this study. And now in this control group, it can either be placebo controlled or it could be active control study. In a placebo control group, this typically happens when we, uh, you know, the disease that we're evaluating doesn't have a standard of care. So it is ethical for one group to receive placebo instead of treatment. Uh, and then in the other group, we give an active treatment. And some studies will actually use an active drug as a control. This is where um, you know, some disease states already have a standard of care established where it would be unethical to give uh, placebo to those patients. So the control group will receive uh, an active drug and then the other group will receive uh, another drug that the, uh, the evaluators are trying to bring to the market, which we actually refer to as intervention group. So the other group is actually uh, the drug that we want to uh, study and evaluate to compare it to our control. So obviously the double arm study is the most common one. So the two arms, one of them would be the control group and the other one would be intervention group. When you have multiple arm studies, one of them will be the control group and then you can compare uh, the control group to multiple interventions. So imagine a four arm study where one of them is the control and three of them are interventions. So you can compare different uh, drugs to the standard of care, for example. Now, occasionally when you have a single arm study, so that single arm would be your intervention group and uh, you would wonder, so how can you have a control group? And that's when you would use a historical control. So uh, that would be a theoretical uh, control group where uh, investigator will use historical data from the past. This typically happens when the standard of care uh, is not very good. So they don't really want to uh, have uh, uh, patients enroll to receive uh, the standard of care, uh, typically due to low effectiveness or severe adverse effects. Now, as we have learned before, when you compare two groups in a study, there are two ways to look at it. We can even either look at a risk difference or you can look at a risk ratio. So let's take a look at risk difference first. So a study, depending on the number of the outcomes in either the intervention group or the um, control group, you can either have absolute risk reduction if the number of events are lower in your intervention group, or you can have an absolute risk increase if the number of events are higher in the intervention group, or there can be no difference between the groups. And the reason we are looking at zero here is because we're looking at the absolute difference between the two groups, meaning that we're subtracting the number of events between the two groups. Now contrast that to the ratio. In a ratio, you're actually dividing the number of events in each group. So there you, can, you can either have relative risk reduction or relative risk increase or no difference between the groups. And now because we're looking at the ratio, we're looking at one as no difference. Now while risk difference and risk ratio are relatively easy to calculate, it's not easy to calculate hazard ratio. And that's because hazard ratio also takes into account the time to event. This analysis is referred to as survival analysis. And one way to visually show these analyses is using Kaplan-Meier curves. Uh, so let's say your let's say your uh, clinical trial is looking at a patient's uh, blood pressure. So let's say you find you you find somebody's blood pressure and it goes here, and then you do it again and it's some some so, something here, and you do it again and it goes here, and you do it again and it goes here, and you do it again and it goes here. You do it again, it goes here, do it again, it goes here, uh, you know, so if you keep repeating, uh, um, you know, your measurements for blood pressure, you start to get a distribution, 
So that's what we mean by distribution. So you know, occasionally you have outliers that are, you know, far from the center of tendency for this. You know, but like at the end of it, uh, what you get is that you get a you get the mean. So there's a mean for the distribution, and then uh, away from the mean you have uh, you, you know st your standard deviation. So a standard deviation. So it's, you can say this is one standard deviation, you know, plus or minus, and then you have two standard deviations plus or minus away from the mean of your distribution and up to three, right? And and then uh, you can see that so one standard deviation away from your mean captures 68 percent of the distribution. So that so this right here is 68 percent of the distribution. Versus if you do two s standard deviations from your mean. So plus minus two will capture ninety five percent of the distribution. So that's a significant number because we are interested in ninety five percent of the distribution, and we think that's clinically significant because that's within two standard deviation that captures ninety five percent. So anything that's outside of the two standard deviation, it could be considered outlier. So that could be like a chance finding. And I'll explain that uh, in a little more detail. Uh, but the reason, be so one specific thing about normal distribution is that because it's symmetric, so your mean, median, and mode will be on the same line. So that's your center of tendency for the distribution. Whereas things that are not normally distributed, you can th you can see that you know. Uh, mean, median, and mode do not lie on the same line. So you can see this either negatively skewed or positively skewed as the data tend to go to, to left or right. So when it comes to interpreting superiority randomized clinical trials, you will hear the concept of two-sided significance level. So as I mentioned, we're interested in 95% of the distribution. So 95% is within uh, you know, two standard deviations from the mean. So here's our center of tendency, and we're interested in 95%. It's common to see a 95% confidence interval. And the way you calculate confidence interval is that it's equals to 1 minus alpha. And alpha is your significance level. So as you, uh, if you remember, um, you know, a p when you interpret p-values, you need to know your alpha because a p-value is significant if it's less than your alpha. And what we typically do in clinical, uh, in randomized clinical trials is that we commonly use a 5% uh, alpha or an alpha of 0 0.05. And that's why, so 1 minus uh, 0 0.05 equals 0 0.95 or 95%. So anytime you have a alpha of 5%, you need to have a confidence interval of 95% uh, so that it uh, follows this rule for co uh, confidence interval. So, so what this means is that uh, obviously mu is the center of tendency or the mean of your distribution. So anytime you do an experiment, uh, what you find in that study is your mean. And if you were to do that study again, chances are that you will not find the exact same thing. So if you do it again, it might be something different. And what we really mean here is that if you do the study again, we are 95% confident that it will be something between uh, within two standard deviations. So anything outside of that might be considered a chance finding, and that's why, uh, you know, when if you remember the concept of type one error, so type one error means like a false. Uh, positive, uh, it can either be on this side or this side, and that's what we mean by two-sided. So it's a, it's a matter of whether it deviates from your finding to the right or to the left. So we allow like a, you know 2.5% uh, type 1 error on this side and a 2.5% error on this side, and together we call this a, a two-sided or two-tailed. Uh, you may hear the concept two-tailed and two-sided. It means the same thing. Two, so two two tail significance level of uh, five percent and superiority randomized control trials will always use a two tail significance level. Now, just to give you an, another example of this equation, so if someone was to use a uh, you know alpha of two percent, so if they use a two sided alpha of two percent, then they will have to use a ninety eight percent confidence interval because if you use a ninety five percent confidence interval with this with an alpha of two percent. 
then that's a violation of this equation. So if you catch that in a randomized clinical trial, that should be a criticism uh, of that study. Let's take a look at some examples. So this is the Charisma trial where uh, the intervention was clopidogrel plus uh, aspirin and the control group was placebo plus aspirin. And the primary endpoint was a composite of myocardial infarction, stroke or death from cardiovascular causes. And this is in patients who had stroke. Now this is a superiority study. So it's tr really trying to show if clopidogrel is superior to placebo. Now, when you look at the results, you can see that the, uh, the p-value is 0.22, meaning that there is no statistically significant difference. However, let's interpret the confidence interval. So you can see that in the study, they found the relative risk of 0.93. So that's what we found here. So that's the, that's the point estimate. 0.93 is what they found in the Charisma study. The question is, if we do this study again, what are they going to find? And they said that it could be something between 0.83 to 1.05 and now because this is a superiority trial we do not want the confidence interval to cross the line of um, unity or line of no difference in this case it crossed the line so one is included within the confidence interval so it is not so statistically significant now note that this p-value is for superiority and is um, in agreement with the confidence interval Let's take a look at another example, the SPRINT trial. This study looked at patients with hypertension and it was uh, comparing intensive treatment to standard treatment. And the primary endpoint was a composite outcome of myocardial infarction, other acute coronary syndromes, stroke, heart failure, or death from cardiovascular causes. As you can see, now the p-value is statistically significant. Again, this is a superiority trial and you can see that in this study, they found the hazard ratio of 0.75. So this is the point estimate. The question is, if we repeat this study, what are we going to find? And they say that it will be something between 0.64 and 0.89. And in th this study, it actually, uh, the confidence inter interval does not include the line of unity. So that's why in this case, we can conclude that the intervention group is superior to control group. Note that in the previous example we did not calculate absolute risk uh, and number needed to treat because the results were not statistically significant. In this case because the results are statistically significant we can actually calculate absolute risk ratio uh, absolute risk reduction and number needed to treat. And also note that this p-value is for superiority so we can say this group is superior to the control group. Now let's look at the Illuminate uh, trial. In this study the primary endpoint was the time to the first major cardiovascular event, which was defined as death from coronary heart disease, non-fatal MI, stroke, or hospitalization for unstable angina. As you can see, they found the, so the p-value is st statistically significant, and the hazard ratio is 1.25. So 1.25 is the point estimate. The question is, if we repeat this study, what are they going to find? And they said that it will be something between 1.09 to 1.44, so as you can see, the confidence interval does not include one. So it's, the results are statistically significant. However, it's on the right side of one. So it's actually in favor of the control group. So the intervention is actually inferior to the control group, or you can claim that the control group is superior to the inter intervention. Again, this p-value is for superiority. Now let's look at the uh, cantata Sioux trial, which is again a superiority trial. Now this one, has a surrogate endpoint of change in weight. So they're looking at the two groups and you can see that they found the difference in weight to be a negative 4.4 kilos, which is the point estimate in this study. Now the results are statistically significant based on the p-value and the confidence interval goes from negative 4.8 to negative 3.9, which does not cross the line of no difference line of unity which is zero since we're looking at an absolute difference now even though the results are statistically significant we're not calculating number needed to treat because this is a surrogate endpoint so this is the syntax trial that looked at um, pci versus cabbage so pci is the, is the intervention group and cabbage is the con control group and the primary endpoint was the composite endpoint of death MI, stroke, and revascularization. So as you can see, 17.8% of patients in the PCI group had either death, 
MI, stroke or revascularization, whereas in the cabbage group, 12.4% had the primary outcome. And the results are statistically significant, as you can see the p-value. And when you look at the risk difference, the risk difference is a positive number. So it's positive 5.4. And because it's positive, it means the absolute risk increase. So you can see more people had the events in the PCI intervention group. So, the event, so it was actually a risk increase. You can also analyze it by looking at the relative risk. So uh, relative risk is 1.44. So the act, uh, because it's greater than 1, that means uh, there were more events in the intervention group. So if we call the PCI group, group A, and the coverage group, group uh, B, uh, then the, uh, the actual risk difference would be uh, A minus B which is uh, 17.8 minus 12.4, which is uh, positive uh, 5.4. 5, 5 so because this is greater than zero, this is an absolute uh, risk increase. And the results are statistically significant. Uh, when you look at the relative risk, you're looking at the ratio. So it's the ratio of A to B. So because you have 17.8, uh, uh, divided by 12.4 uh, you get 1.44 uh, uh, which is greater than 1 and that's how you know this is a relative uh, risk uh, increase so when you uh, look at the risk difference because if you subtract the same number you get 0 you don't want this confidence interval to cross 0 and it didn't so it goes from positive 2.13 to positive 8.83 so it did not cross 0 also, if you look at the relative risk, uh, because the same number divided by itself would be 1 and 1 would be no difference, you don't want the confidence interval to cross 1, So and it didn't. It, it, it's from 1.15 to 1.81, so it's statistically significant, and the p-value is consistent with it. Now, the problem is, if you were to tell someone about the results of this, uh, they may be wondering, well, if I get the, you know, looks like cabbage, had less events so if someone was to get cabbage are they less likely to die and that's hard to tell from a composite endpoint that's why it's important to look at the individual components of the composite endpoint so when you look at death you can see that the, it's actually no there's no statistically significant difference between the two groups so it really does make it doesn't make any difference on the uh, mortality outcome now when you look at stroke you can actually see that the stroke is in favor of the PCI group. So if people were to get uh, PCI, they're less likely to have stroke because as you can see, uh, five uh, or 0.6%, less than 1% of patients had stroke in the PCI group and 2.2% had stroke in the cabbage group. So now you can see the relative, uh, or I should say the risk difference is a negative number. So now, you're looking at an absolute risk um, decrease in favor of the PCI group. And it's statistically significant. Look at the p-value and it didn't cross zero. So it's all of it is in the negative side. The same is true with the relative risk. You can see that it's less than one and it didn't cross one. So now for the stroke, it's actually in favor of the PCI group, even though the composite endpoint doesn't say that. Now you look at MI, you can also see there was no difference. And then when you look at the revascular subsequent revascularization, you can see that um, you know a lot fewer people had revascularization in the cabbage group. So that's actually it's revascularization that's driving the composite endpoint. So although when you bundle all of them together, it looks like it's in favor of cabbage, but it's really the revascularization that's driving it. So if someone didn't want to have stroke, it's actually to their benefit to get the PCI intervention.